the true vine. He's likening himself to a grapevine. And the the vine is the, the trunk of the tree, okay? I am the true vine, he says. My father is the husbandman. A husbandman is the one that keeps the vine. It's called sometimes the vine dresser. They're the one that cultivates the, the grapevine. My father is a husbandman. And then he says, verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. We talked about that last week. He lifteth it up. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 3, now you are clean or purged through the word which I have spoken unto you. So last week we looked at how God deals with branches that produce no fruit. And the reason they produce no fruit is because the natural tendency of grapevine branches is to grow low on the ground. And when they grow on the ground, they get covered with dirt. When it rains, that dirt becomes mud. And uh, they don't get the necessary air and sunlight uh, in order to produce fruit. In fact, they often mildew and mold in that dirt and that mud. And I said last week that that's a picture of how believers are pulled down by sin in their life, the dirt being sin, and then how God helps them deal with it, how God cleans them up. You know, God's a very determined vine keeper. God will never quit tending your branch, you who are a branch. God will make sure that you're fruitful. I'm thankful for verses that teach us that. He says, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ or until Jesus returns for us. So he's not going to quit on you. In fact, God's not just satisfied with a little fruit in your life because his purpose for you has always been more spiritual abundance than you think or that you're satisfied with. And the way that God coaxes more fruit from your life is in that second verse. And that is, he purges. And that word purges means he prunes. Like a vine keeper prunes the branches on a grapevine God prunes our lives. Now, I don't know how much horticulture you are familiar with. I don't know if you know anything about grapevines, but uh, do we have any pictures available? Uh, I had a picture of a very fruitful vine that we've been looking at the last couple of times. and uh, But I wanted you to see a picture tonight of a pruned grapevine. All right, this is a prune grape. That looks pretty pathetic, right? I mean, it looks dead. Look at all the branches on the ground. These are the are the branches that have been pruned off. And here is the the true. Here's the vine. Here's the trunk, and uh, and here's the the uh, the two leaders that run off of that. And these are all the branches off of the the trunk. So Jesus is the true vine. Where are the branches? But look at how they've all been pruned back. There's just a little bit of the branch on, on, the, uh, on the vine. This happens. They do this after the, uh, the harvest. After the harvest of the grapes. You have the picture of the, of the, of the beautiful, uh, bountiful, uh, full grapevine. After they pick those grapes, then in the, uh, the late fall, winter, they prune them like that. They cut the, the branches down to just a nub. And uh, the reason they do that is because to prune means to thin. It means to reduce. It means to, of course, cut off. And as paradoxical and as illogical and as counterintuitive as it sounds, when it comes to having a big 
Grape harvest, less is more. Less is more. You cut back those branches so there's hardly anything left so that when grape, uh, when, when springtime comes, those branches will grow out and they will not waste their strength and their nutrients. The vine will not waste its nutrients on unnecessary uh, growth. So that's what pruning is. Now, there's several things I want to I want to share with you from these uh, from that thought that I hope will help your spiritual life tonight. So let's look to the Lord because we can't do it without Him, our Heavenly Father. Just as uh, we are simply branches, and only You can make us fruitful, only You can produce the fruit in these branch lives, Lord. We are depending upon you tonight to speak to our hearts and to use this simple truth from the picture, the metaphor of a grapevine to make us spiritually fruitful people. So Lord, thank you for this and uh, help us to be focused on what it is that you have to say to us as individuals. Let us not miss it and let us receive with open heart, all that Jesus wants to show us. And we want this for your glory, because we want you to be glorified, and you are, through much fruit. And Lord, whether there's little or none, we want to be people that bear much fruit and thus bring glory to you. And we pray that for that purpose in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's talk a moment about just the natural tendency of a grapevine. The plant's natural tendency, of course, is to grow very vigorously. You can, you can cut back those branches to almost nothing. But when the springtime arrives and the growing season begins, those branches will, will fill out in just one season real quickly like that. And so it's the tendency of a grapevine to grow very vigorously, to become dense, and as a result, to uh, uh, have areas that are hidden from uh, the, the sun and uh, the air so that it doesn't to form and develop right. And so that's why it's necessary to cut back those branches. Uh, if you could put the picture up there again and, and just keep it up for a little bit. Uh, of the, the pruning of these uh, of this grapevine. The, the reason <clears throat> that those, uh, those branches are laying on the ground is because those are unnecessary. Okay, they, they've uh, already produced what needs to be produced. And now they are cut back so that new growth can come out of that grapevine, out of that trunk. Those uh, branches on the ground are what are called shoots. And to get more from the grapevine, if you just leave the grapevine to itself, it'll put out more shoots than it will grapes. And so you have to cut the shoots off so that all of the strength of the grapevine can go more directly to producing grapes than just these, these shoots off the branches. And so... To prune a grapevine is really to go against the nature of that grapevine, to cut it away, to cut a lot of wood away, as you see each year. Unnecessary shoots, because the main purpose of a grapevine is not to grow branches, but to produce grapes. And so pruning is probably the, the singular most important technique to have an abundant harvest of grapes. And that's what that pictures. That's what's going on here. Now, so that parallels our lives because Jesus says in that uh, second verse, we're the branches. He says, every branch in me 
that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Those branches that need to be cut back, that need to be cut away so that uh, fruitfulness can be abundant represents the natural tendency in every one of us. The natural tendency in our lives is to grow our self-life, is to make ourselves the center of everything, to live self-centered lives. That's our natural tendency. And that represents an unnecessary, rampant growth that really hinders the Holy Spirit from producing his fruit in and through our lives. And so he has to cut back the natural tendency of growth in our life. That is the self-life. He deals with it. And how is the self-life uh, represented? Well, in unimportant preoccupation, we are often, the self-life will have us occupy ourselves with unimportant stuff as far as eternal value is concerned. And also uh, wrong priorities in our life that really keep us back and, and hinder us from significant fruitfulness in our lives. Sometimes that, that uh, self-life is seen in just immature commitment that we make and, uh, and uh, uh, lesser priorities that uh, may appeal to us and, and even sometimes make us look spiritual, I think. It is the self-life, that natural tendency that is equivalent to the, the natural tendency of the growth of these shoots, that the Holy Spirit of God, that Jesus, through the, the husbandman, is pruning. He's cutting away. And it's interesting to me, and I think I said this last week, that the word purgeth in verse 2 and the word clean in verse 3 are from the same root word. So you could read verse 3, now are you purged through the word which I have spoken unto you. Do you get the picture? What he's saying is, you know, when they uh, prune a grapevine like this, they have a special pruning instrument. It might be uh, a knife. A, let's call it a pruning knife. Well, the pruning knife that God uses to prune our self-life, that is the natural tendency, is, of course, in verse 3, the word of God. He says, the word that I have, now are you clean through the word or purged through the word I have spoken unto you. He uses the word of God to cut away the self-life, spiritual surgery, cutting away the self-life. <clears throat> my natural tendency is to center my life around me. And the Lord has, for how many years I've been saved, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I can't give you the exact number tonight, but uh, I've been saved a lot longer than, I've been responding to the pruning knife of the Holy Spirit. I would say that. But since I've been paying attention to the Lord at work in my life, he's done a lot of cutting away and he's still working. There's still a, a, a plentiful amount of the self-life that need. It always springs up. It's all every, it, it, he cuts it back and another branch shoots out of the self-life and the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God. You know why it's so important for you every day to be in the Word of God? That's the Holy Spirit's pruning knife. That's how he deals with our self-life. If we don't expose ourselves to the Word of God on a regular basis, the self-life is going to be predominant in your life. You're not going to live a Spirit-filled life. You're not going to live a spiritual life. You're going to, you're, you're going to look like... Uh, unsafe people around you, in some ways, you're going to be carnal. You're going to be living for yourself, even though you're saved and on your way to heaven. And that's not how Christians should be living. That's not what Jesus wants. He wants fruitfulness in our lives. And fruitfulness only happens when we allow him to take the pruning knife of God's word and cut away more and more of the self-life. So that's the natural tendency that is pictured here. But 
I should say this, that uh, while this is a physical thing, with a pruning knife, cutting away the branch, uh, the 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 uh, unnecessary shoots on a on a grapevine. The husband, the vine keeper, the father, his pruning our lives is spiritual activity. It is God that gets involved in our lives. That's how much He cares about us. The father is the husbandman. He's the vine keeper, and He cares about us so much that he intervenes in our lives by pruning our lives, by pruning back, by cutting away the self-life of our immature commitments and our and uh, uh, and lesser priorities that uh, that take up our time that shouldn't. And he prunes those away to make room for a great abundance of spiritual fruit that God's looking for and that glorifies him. Without the Lord intervening with the pruning knife of the word of God in our lives, you'll never live up to the purpose for which God made you. You'll never reach the full spiritual fruitful potential that he has in mind for your life. And uh, uh, God is always at work to remove those areas of the self-life. Can I give you just quickly four specific areas? that he deals with the self-life in us. I thought about this, and, and these are some, some things. I, I, and I, I, I call the first one, he deals with us and cuts away in the self-life area of what I call camaraderies. I mean, relationships. The people that we hang out with, you might say. You know, Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I know the Bible says that Jesus, uh, he sat and ate with sinners. That's very clear. But they weren't his close friends. He reached, he sat with them so that he could win them to himself. But his closest friends were the 12 disciples. Those were the ones that he hung out with. If you hang out with the lost, you will be connected with the old activities that uh, they're interested in and that they participate in. And if you get involved deeply with that, it will leave you feeling empty. You'll not feel like you fit in, like you're out of place. I remember when I surrendered my life to the Lord, I remember how out of place I felt with the old friends that I used to do things that I don't even want to think about anymore. I it, I didn't fit in anymore. And it, it kind of hurt because, honestly, I didn't have to drop them. They dropped me because I was no more fun like I used to be. I didn't go along with what they, they liked doing anymore. And so I, I felt out of place. But God replaced that, that camaraderie with real spiritual friendship that have, uh, that's that's blessed my life through many years. I think of what the psalmist says. He says in Psalm 119, verse 63, I am a companion or a friend of all them that fear thee, those that keep your precepts. In other words, those that honor the word of God. That, he says, is who I am a companion of. So God trims away with the pruning knife of the word of God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, our camaraderies. Second area is what I call our tendencies. He prunes our tendencies. He teaches us and works in us to let go of sinful habits that hinder our fellowship with the Lord and also with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. He trims those self-oriented behaviors in our lives that strangle and choke out uh, fruitful living and serving of the Lord. You know, 
there's a there's a principle in agriculture that also is true in the spiritual life. And you know what it is? It's this. They that sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but those that sow to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And so God will prune those tendencies, those selfish habits that, uh, that hinder your fellowship with him and with your brothers and sisters. He wants you to be others-oriented and not self-oriented. There's a third area that I believe the, the Lord prunes us in our lives, and that is an area that I call our priorities. He brings us to a point where we have to make a choice to devote more time and energy to the internal versus the external. Am I going to spend time more time at the gym or am I going to spend more time with the Lord? You know, the scripture says that bodily exercise profits little, but uh, godliness is profitable both now and unto eternal life. And so we have to let the pruning knife of God's word prune our priorities. Am I going to spend more time on my job or with assembling with my brothers and sisters and serving the Lord? He's pruning our priorities. And uh, not, to, uh, not because I want to give a personal example, but I remember when I had to make a choice as a young man whether I would take a job that would keep me out of, uh, out of the assembly on a Sunday or not. And I remember... I was offered a good paying job that I needed. I was a newly uh, married uh, man, and uh, soon we were going to have our first child. And I'm thinking, boy, I need to make, and, and my wife was going full time uh, to college, and I was uh, part time in grad school. Oh, I needed to make some money, and I got offered this job. And then when I took it, I realized, wait a minute, it's working on Sundays. And I think it was like a Friday when I had talked with HR and took the job. I went home and I had a miserable weekend. And I and I determined by the time Monday rolled around, I went back to the to the guy and I said, you know what? I really appreciate that job offer, but I just cannot conscientiously take it because I I can't work on Sunday. I'm not to forsake the assembling of myself together with God's people. And I want to be with my brothers and sisters in the Lord's uh, uh, together in the assembly. <laughs> you know what he said to me? He said, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, well, I have another job offer, and he and it's a Monday through Friday, a second shift. I was going to school in the mornings, his second shift, and it paid more money when I took the job, okay? Just priorities, the pruning knife of, of the Word of God. And then there is a fourth area that I would mention, and I call that opportunities. Uh, God is pruning areas of opportunity. Whether we use opportunities for ourself, our self-interest, or whether we use our opportunities because we're open to following God's will outside of our own personal comfort zone. And then I'm thinking of that, uh, that passage of Jesus in Matthew 16, where he says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross which is an instrument of death. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Opportunities. Are we going to use these opportunities for ourselves? Or are we open to following the will of God? outside of our own comfort zones. And then there's a third thing that I wanted to bring out from this, not only the natural tendency, the spiritual activity of, the, of God pruning our lives in these areas, but the personal sensitivity. And by that, I mean this. Pruning 
the work that God does in pruning our lives, purging our lives, <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> it brings ache to us. Pruning is painful. And human beings try to avoid pain at all costs. But you know what? God uses pain to get our attention. In fact, it was C.S. Lewis that says, God whispers through pleasure, but he shouts through pain. God reveals our weakness in our pain, right? We're going to see that on Sunday, by the way, when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. God reveals our weakness through our pain and shows us that we need his strength. Don't misread God's motive in pruning your life just because it's painful. Don't fight him. Don't do battle against what God's trying to do in pruning your life, but work with him because in the end, you'll be the winner. In the end, great spiritual abundance and fruitfulness. Yes, it brings ache into your life, but let me let me say this. Have you ever asked God? Have you ever asked? Have you ever prayed to the Lord? Lord, help me to be fruitful. Make me fruitful. Lord, I want to grow. Help me to grow. Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. Make me more Christ-like. Well, you know what? You know how he answers that prayer? He prunes you. He prunes your life. That's how he answers that prayer. So ask God to show you clearly what he wants you to let go of, what he wants to prune out of your life. Ask God to show you clearly what he wants you to let go of and then trust him enough to let it go, to release it to him and at the same time, claim his fruit in its place. Claim his fruitfulness in the place of what he takes and cuts away from you. And then I should say this. There's an area, I think, talking about personal sensitivity when it comes to pruning. It does bring ache to the life. But there's a need to ask, and he will do it. But perhaps there's also a need in your life to admit something. And that is, if you've been fighting God because of the pruning that you've been suffering, if you've been embittered with God because of the ache that the pruning brings into your experience, you know what you need to do? You need to get that right with him. You really do. You need to confess that. that was, it's not right to fight God when he's only doing for you what is best. And you need to get it right with him. You know, when I was a, a young junior high, high schooler, I was a rebel. I have to admit, I was a rebel. I did a lot of stuff on the, on the sly. My parents didn't know about, but I did it behind their back. And, uh, but there came a time when I got right with God when I was in college. And I, I, I'm not sure of the, uh, the circumstance. I think when I went home, maybe on Christmas vacation or whatever. But there, there was a time when I sat down with my mom and dad and I got right with them. And I apologized to them. I, I admitted that there were times when I really hated them uh, and uh, I couldn't stand them and I just wanted to get away from them. And, and I, I, I was angry because of the discipline that they um, put me through and brought into my life. So I, I admitted all of that to them and I asked them to forgive me for the wrong attitude and for my rebellion against them and for the, the, uh, the terrible way that I thought about them and how I, you know, I rebelled. Perhaps that's what you need to do with your heavenly father. Maybe you need to go to your heavenly father and confess to him how you've injured him and then submit to him and accept the pruning process that he's doing in your life. Someone said this, the most fruitful, the most joyful Christian is the most pruned Christian. You see, less, those branches of self-life, is more. 
less self is more fruit.